Hello, good morning. So I wrote my thesis on political entrepreneurship of terrorism, and I adapted it today um, just for a short presentation. Despite extensive research on the psychological motivation of terrorists, less research has focused on the unique abilities of leaders and their strategies to recruit new members. This paper applies the theory of political entrepreneurship to the cases of the Islamic State and the National Socialist German Workers' Party. My research suggests that terrorist leaders have unique psychological qualities that allow them to emerge as political entrepreneurs, and terrorist leaders capitalize upon the grievances of various groups as part of a recruitment strategy. These cases affirm the reasonableness of existing concepts in political science to incorporate a new phenomenon like terrorism. In the wake of September 11th, academics consulted across disciplines to analyze demographic, psychological, and political characteristics that define a terrorist. It can be a comforting notion to assume that terrorists are irrational or suffer from extreme psychological disorders from a public opinion perspective. From an academic perspective, it becomes clear that most terrorists are attracted to groups because of a belief that extreme violence is the only way to alleviate common frustrations in their communities. Leaders of terrorist organizations can successfully manipulate these frustrations to serve a greater purpose deemed essential to the leader. The Nazis and ISIS are examples of organized groups with leaders accustomed to manipulating youth who are resentful towards circumstances beyond their control and able to convince them that the organization is the only way to alleviate this frustration effectively. These cases suggest that leadership reinforces goals and undermines individuality. Academics differ very widely on the exact definition of terrorism. While many specific definitions exist, a more broad-based definition is the most appropriate. A broad definition is essential because the historical practices of terrorism vary, involve both state and non-state actors, and constantly evolve to fit the modern climate. What specifically sets terrorism apart is the deliberate nature of the action. Caleb Carr defines terrorism as the contemporary name given to warfare deliberately waged against civilians with the purpose of destroying their will to support leaders or policies which the agents find objectionable. This def definition can also be expanded to include, include actions against the leaders enacting the policies the terrorists find so objectionable. However, the warfare against the established governmental institution must include civilians as collateral damage. In addition, the nature of the group must be revolutionary in nature, seeking to overthrow a government or a system that suppresses or is not aligned with the group's moral standards and goals. Therefore, for the purpose of this presentation, terrorism will be defined as the actions of a non-state actor, even if this group has established a pseudo-state. Once gaining legitimate power and recognized by the international community, a group ceases to be considered a terrorist group, even though the group's actions may continue to be terroristic in nature. Psychologists differ on the exact reasons that an individual is attracted to a terrorist group. Psychologists assume most terrorists are rational and rarely meet the criteria for insanity or psychopathy. Many terrorists join a group for social reasons. Terrorists are attracted to the group because of the desire to formulate an identity. A related theory is the identity theory, which contends that a terrorist may lack individual identity, which can be recognized and capitalized upon by a terrorist leader to ensure that the recruit will adopt a group identity and seize any individual autonomy. In addition, there is often a specific environment that breeds the perfect conditions for a terrorist group to rise off. First off, there is often a sense of international isolation. This can mean two things. One, that the region where the terrorism rises is ignored by the international community, leading to a lack of awareness and therefore international intervention, or that the international community has purposefully isolated the region. Secondly, there is often political disenfranchisement of a group or region that is being dominated or oppressed. This oppression can come from an opposing religion, political power and party, or even political party and power, or even the international community. From the political science discipline, rational choice theory addresses political concerns a terrorist may have. According to this theory, terrorists join a group because the group is perceived to have the potential to solve a political grievance. Often terrorist leaders can convince terrorists that the group is the most practical way to achieve political change. Another theory related to polit political grievances is oppression theory. This theory states that when a government humiliates and robs an individual of dignity, the individual is more likely to join a terrorist group as a chance to feel accepted and appreciated. 
The relative deprivation theory addresses the poverty thesis specifically. Many terrorists join a group because of a lack of economic opportunity. Leaders can thus convince the recruits that a group is a way out of poverty. While many terrorists are rational, some psychologists contend that the leaders often suffer from narcissism, which allows a leader to assimilate a group with the cult-like tendencies that are often associated with terrorist groups. In the context of studying United States politics and the behavior of political representatives in response to electoral cycles, political scientists introduce political entrepreneurship as a concept to explore the elements of a leader and the leader's ability to control groups. William Rieker, the leading academic on political entrepreneurship, suggests that political entrepreneurs are those who have an ability to change the political climate and produce policy changes in unexpected ways. Political entrepreneurs can add new dimensions to political debates. These leaders often have significant talents that could be directed elsewhere. However, they choose to direct energy towards political causes because of the perceived benefits to themselves. Similarly, terrorist leaders act as political entrepreneurs, framing an issue in particular ways and creating a story that attracts a group of people and creates a group ideology. The terrorist is expected to assimilate into the group and assume this created group identity. Terrorist leaders are often extremely charismatic and use this charisma to attract members of society who are particularly vulnerable. They often convince these members to give, give up individual autonomy for a collective good while they remain tied to very strategic individual goals for themselves. Leaders convince potential recruits to believe that every member of the group will reap the benefits of the group's actions. Political entrepreneurship is considered a rather new concept in the political science discipline. However, it is easy to look to history to see numerous examples of the political entrepreneurship of terrorist groups. The Nazi movement is a perfect example of the dangers a political entrepreneur can pose, as Adolf Hitler is one of the most talented and successful political entrepreneurs in history. The most successful and dangerous political entrepreneurs in the context of terrorism are able to graduate a group from the status as a rogue terrorist group to that of a legitimate recognized power. Once maneuvering the Nazi party way to power through the established political system, Hitler was able to gain control over the official state bureaucracy, military, and other traditional state mechanisms. Therefore, the consequences of a terrorist group becoming an officially recognized state power can best be exemplified by the Nazi rights rise to power, which resulted in the conquest of Europe, killing and displacing millions. The Hitler case can serve as a warning to take seriously the consequences of a terrorist group possessing a leader who has the skills to successfully maneuver a group's entry into the mainstream system. The best political entrepreneurs know their audience. A political entrepreneur understands the grievances and challenges facing their particular focus group. The main grievances facing the German public during the 1920s were crippling poverty and unemployment due to massive inflation and the United States stock market crash. This poverty could be attributed to the worldwide crash, but also was specific to the German economy because Germany was forced to pay gross war reparation payments to the Allied powers as a result of the Versailles Treaty. Hitler himself fought in World War I and was humiliated and angered by the war guilt clause and the dishonorable surrender of Germany. Hitler, although Austrian rather than German, understood the nation's trauma and perfectly manipulated the public mood to support a return to the German nation's rightful glory. Hitler understood instinctively that individuals wish to belong to something greater than themselves and seek a great ideal that goes beyond the mundane reality of day-to-day -day life. The German people were in a perfect position to be introduced to a new and all-encompassing ideal. Fanatic movements, fanatical movements breed well in conditions of poverty, humiliation, and political disenfranchisement. The Weimar Republic was simply too moderate and concerned with maintaining the status quo to inspire millions of Germans wishing to escape the bleak reality of post-war life. Communism was another attractive outlet during the 1920s, but did not succeed in gaining power in Germany because it don't, did not have the personality of a Hitler to successfully manipulate it. The ideal that Hitler was created was to put Germany back into the international community as a respected world power. Hitler believed that the German people were the greatest race on earth and deserved to have ultimate glory. This new ideal state of Germans would be classless, similar to communism, except that its legitimacy and claim to greatness would be based on the strength of the so-called people's community. With the Vogue united, nothing could stop Germany from regaining military and social superiority over Europe. Hitler maintained that Germany deserved living space beyond the small confines of Germany's border. 
With unemployment in Germany at the time of Hitler's rise over 50%, this great ideal that would put Germans as the master race combined with a figure who could fulfill all of their wildest dreams and ambitions was enough to convince an increasing number of Germans that Hitler was Germany's answer. Along with creating an ideal, a successful political entrepreneur can often create a myth or story that gives credence to what otherwise would be considered abhorrent violence. Hitler created an all-encompassing myth with several layers. The main basis behind this myth was the notion of an Aryan superior race that must weed itself of any non-desirable element. While the Nazis deplored anyone who did not fit this Aryan stereotype, the Jews were especially despised. Hitler believed that world Jewry was responsible for all the ills in the world and that the Jewish people had gained far too much power in all sectors. As a further way to validate this hatred, Hitler cultivated the stab in a back myth, a myth that had already existed for some time but was fully embraced by Hitler, which asserted that Germany had been stabbed in the back by military leaders and particularly the Jewish people who did not fight in World War I and apparently orchestrated Germany's humiliation for personal profit, according to Hitler. At first, the Nazis were predominantly interested in overthrowing the government by violent means, like a traditional terrorist group. The Nazis won power on the streets of major cities like Berlin and Munich through the Nazis' military wing, the SA, terrorizing opponents and the general population. The SA was Hitler's established pseudo-army that was to suppress the opposition, specifically communist opposition, and maintain control over select portions of the population. The SA sought to establish headquarters and recruit young men that were disillusioned with the Weimar Republic and desired glory. The SA's leader, Ernst Röhm, firmly believed that a military coup could successfully overthrow the government and convinced Hitler that the SA had what it takes. Rome believed his pseudo-army was a genuine military, despite the fact that it was not state-sanctioned and consisted mostly of disillusioned young men who had never experienced actual warfare. Hitler initially thought of this group as the best method for achieving power. The next phase of the Hitler rise is the most dangerous. After uh, the rebellion at Munich failed, Hitler decided that the way to gain power was not through organized violence, but through the political system. This realization was dangerous because Hitler was able to devise a unique strategy to gain power that sets the Nazis apart from most other terrorist groups. Hitler sought to uncover ways that the Nazis could gain power through the conventional system and successfully maneuver the status of the Nazis from that of terrorist group to official political party. The Nazis were successful due to violent language, making statements such as hell to Versailles and refusing to compromise on matters of German greatness, something other groups were unwilling to do. Hitler was willing to deal with the traditional system in an effort to be seen as someone who could be negotiated with. Other terrorist groups make the mistake of assuming violence is the sole means to achieve power and do not attempt to infiltrate the system by disguising the group as a political party. The so-called Islamic State distinguishes itself from other terrorist groups in several ways. Firstly, like the Nazis, ISIS has farther reaching goals and sole political autonomy. ISIS wishes to establish an ideal Muslim state that would incorporate all true believers. Therefore, ISIS does not recognize established international boundaries. In addition, ISIS has been successful in recruiting a wide range of individuals. While most terrorist organizations recruit directly from the local population and primarily draw youth, ISIS has attracted a great variety of age groups. ISIS is also unique in its ability to recruit international membership, rather than targeting a specific nationality. Secondly, ISIS tactics are so abhorrent and barbaric that even ISIS once counterpart Al-Qaeda has criticized the group's effort. Incidents like beheading and the mass rape of the female population subjugated under ISIS control has left the international community bewildered as to why ISIS has had such success in recruiting new membership. The reasons behind joining the terrorist group are not widely understood considering the treatment followers often receive. ISIS cannot just be viewed as a local terrorist group simply terrorizing the local population, but now must be seen as a threat to world stability. Many academics have argued that ISIS does not qualify as a terrorist group. The main reason given for this is that ISIS functions as a state with a pseudo-army and pseudo-bureaucracy. The key word in this description is pseudo. ISIS armed forces and administration are not sanctioned or internationally recognized. Like the Nazis when the group was attempting to rise to power, ISIS successfully dominates area of territory and undergoes actions against the established government. 
However, ISIS use of an armed force and control of territory does not make ISIS a state, nor does ISIS involvement in the Syrian civil war give immunity from being defined as a terrorist group. The main goal of ISIS is to reestablish the Caliphate, a greater Muslim state that was once led by the successors of Muhammad, known as Caliphs. The ideal state seeks to unite all Muslim peoples in unity against the negative influences of the West. In addition, the group considers itself as a key agent in the coming apocalypse, guaranteeing salvation to all members who join ISIS. While other Islamic terrorist organizations like Hamas and Al-Qaeda desired a Muslim state, both groups have been much more patient in dealing with local political frustrations first. ISIS is much more uncompromising in the view that this ideal state must be established as soon as possible. The main ISIS leadership mirrors the Nazi leadership, possessing a leader with great charisma and a cult-like following. Abu Bakr al-Baqadi is a self-proclaimed caliph of ISIS. Hang on, just three more minutes, Mark, sorry. <laughs> Al-Baghdadi was imprisoned, allowing for, the further, allowing for the further radicalization and refinement of al-Baghdadi's worldview, most notably a hatred of the West, similar to Hitler. ISIS leaders have a very wide variety of income, which allows them to have a lot of control over the population due to the fact that terrorist organizations are most successful when they have political and economic success. ISIS leaders are also uniquely able to recruit Muslim fundamentalists as ISIS leaders state that religion gives us an inner peace and appeals to members of Western society that are confused between the often harsh differences between Western society and Islamic society as a whole. They also, this is why they have been particularly successful in recruiting women. The fact that women across the world and even Western countries are willing to give up everything to live under the theory of ISIS is due primarily to ISIS successful recruitment practices. Capitalizing on the struggles Muslim females face living in the Western world, ISIS leaders have portrayed the Western emancipation of a woman as a ruse meant to sexualize women. The Western world is really degrading women further and making it easier for men to view women as solely sexual objects, according to ISIS. Considering Western countries such as France have banned the burqa, it is understandable how Muslim women might be confused between the line of tradition and diversity. In comparing ISIS and the Nazis, the main lesson one can take away is to heed the warnings. When a terrorist group decides to play by international and domestic political rules, leaders can successfully maneuver the group from terrorist status to official recognized state. Hitler was no less a terrorist leader than the others, but Hitler was crafty enough to recognize that the group must feign to play by established rules in order to gain legitimate power. Therefore, it is wise to recognize the dangers of a terrorist group attempting to operate in normal established channels and prudent to exercise with caution any attempts to negotiate with or appease terrorist leaders. The potential for terrorist leaders to take on the role of political entrepreneurs and, and manipulate a population provides many causes for concern. If the leader is physically or metaphorically cut off from the community, chances are higher that terrorism will subside because of the lack of an organizer and common identity. If Hitler had been killed during the early days when the Nazis had status as a terrorist group, chances are the, ISIS, the Nazis never could have come to power. If attempts continue to be made to strike at ISIS, a similar result should take place. In addition, it is essential to address real concerns of terrorists themselves in order to prevent their vulnerability to prospective political entrepreneurs. Focusing on the root causes of terrorism undermine the incentives available to existing ter terrorist leaders who attempt to recruit the most vulnerable. The cases of the Nazis and ISIS are generalizable and contribute to political science's study of terrorists as part of a familiar framework. Thank you.